This week on Q&A, author and former Special Inspector General of the federal government's Troubled Asset Relief Program, Neil Borofsky, discusses his new book titled Bailout. Neil Borofsky, author of Bailout. What role did a man named Bill Burke play in this story uh, that you wrote in your book? Well, Bill was a former colleague of mine. I used to be a prosecutor up in the Southern District of New York, and I I met Bill there. Um, We had become sort of friendly, uh, if not close. He was a couple years junior to me in the office. And I reconnected with him once I started the process of applying for the job of Special Inspector General to oversee the bailouts. Bill, at that time, had moved to the White House and was the Deputy General Counsel, um, basically serving right under Fred Fielding, who was White House Counsel. Um, And Bill gave me some advice as I was going through that process. Um, and then after I got the job, as someone who, had, who I'd known from New York and was now really integrated in Washington, he sort of was my political sounding board. I didn't really know too much about how the politics of the city worked. Um, and Bill, who had been in the Department of Justice, had been at the White House, had a real fundamental understanding of those things. So every time I would come up against a, a brick wall or, or a really sort of very touchy, tricky mess that I had gotten myself into, uh, Bill was there as a sounding board to help me sort of navigate, let me know sort of how the town worked, uh, how I could use Congress to effectively help me when I was running to certain blo- roadblocks that were put up by the administration, um, and generally to buck me up sometimes when uh, I felt a little beaten down or a little overwhelmed. Uh, Bill would help give me some some focus and and remind me that you know I had an opportunity with this job not just to provide oversight over the $700 billion bailout, uh, but to use it as a bully pulpit, in his words, uh, to try to affect positive change as we were going through this bailout. What impact did it have on anything that he was a Republican in a George Bush administration inside the White House in the counselor's office, and you were a Democrat? Um, you know, coming from the U.S. Attorney's Office up in New York, um, politics were really never much of an issue. Um, we were colleagues, we became friends, and I just mean, not just me and Bill, but, but overall. And it sort of transcended politics. We sort of had a, a shared mission. And it, politics were really not something we talked about that much. And I have friends who I never knew if they were Republicans or Democrats until years later. Um, and my interactions with Bill, it was, it was sort of irrelevant. You know, Bill was also very good friends with Chuck, then Chuck Schumer's legal count, chief legal counsel, uh, Preet Bharara, who went on to become an Obama nominee as the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. So our interactions really weren't about, although they were very political in discussions, it wasn't about partisan politics. Uh, It really was never an issue. You lead off this story uh, with a man named Herb Allison. Uh, Who is he and what role did he play and what's that story about in the beginning? So so Herb was, um, at the time, was the Assistant Secretary of Financial Stability, which meant that his job was to oversee the implementation of TARP the Troubled Asset Relief Program, the $700 billion uh, funded bank bailout. Um, Prior to that, uh, Herb had a storied career on Wall Street. He had had just about every major job you can imagine at Merrill Lynch, including being its president, its CFO. Um, He then went on to become the CEO of uh, TIA-CREF and had actually retired in 2008 when Hank Paulson, who was then Treasury Secretary, called him as the financial crisis was just beginning to take off um, and asked him to come to Washington to run Fannie Mae after um, it had been put into conservatorship, basically nationalized by the United States government. Um, and then in April of 2009, he, became, uh, he came in and was eventually made the head of TARP. Um, so my interactions with him, since I was providing oversight of TARP, was basically providing oversight and in many times being very critical a lot of the things that, that he was doing, that the Treasury Department was doing, um, that Secretary Geithner was doing. He was my main portal into, into Treasury. Um, that meeting had come about, we had had a, a number of conflicts, uh, as you can imagine. Our jobs were not necessarily uh, going to create a, a long-lasting friendship. It was my job was to criticize him and make recommendations where I thought that he and the program had gone off the rails, which by 2010 was, was pretty often. Um, So we decided to have a meeting offline, if you will, to sort of clear the air, have a couple of drinks and try to um, diffuse what was a building tension between the two of us. Our weekly meetings had devolved into into shouting matches often. Um, 
at this meeting, though, what happened was I got a real taste of, of how Washington works. Um, and what Allison told me during this meeting was he, we sort of had a little chit chat and small talk about our families. Uh, I told him that my first daughter was about to be born. She was about three weeks away at that point. Um, he talked to me about his commute to Washington, back and forth from Connecticut where he lived and his grown children. Um, and he, he eventually turned the conversation and pointed out that I was, I was young, that my job as Special Inspector General was by its very nature a temporary one, and sort of asked me about what my plans were, what I wanted to do next. Um, and as we started discussing it, he gave me a warning. He said that I was doing myself real harm uh, for my future prospects, in his words. And, and by that, he explained that I had a very harsh tone. I was very critical of Wall Street and very critical of the Obama administration um, as I was carrying out my, my job as, as SIGTARP and providing oversight. And he warned me that if I didn't change my tone, it was going to hurt my ability to get a job after SIGTARP, when I left the government, uh, presumably to go get a job on Wall Street, that I was doing myself real harm. When I explained to him I wasn't really interested in that, he, he then said, well, even within the administration, um, but that if I changed my tone, became a little bit more upbeat and positive, uh, good things could happen to me. Uh, he mentioned even perhaps uh, an Obama appointment as, as, a, as a federal judge, uh, if only I would change my tone. Now, at the time when I heard that conversation, I thought I was being threatened or bribed, to be honest with you. I thought I was hearing, basically, if you don't shape up, mister, uh, you're either going to ruin your entire career, uh, but if you change your tune, you know, good things can happen to you. I think later I realized that he was just sort of explaining to me how Washington worked and what it means to be a regulator in Washington. And that means pull your punches, go with the flow, and roll, and great things could happen to you, including a rich career on Wall Street. Uh, but speak your mind and be effective, and you could do yourself real harm. Herb Allison, uh, you, as you described, came from Merrill Lynch and TIA, CREF, and also headed up Fannie Mae. Also ran the John McCain financial operation back in, when he ran for president? I believe so, yes. He, here's some video I want you to see and, and uh, give us some more fill in on this. Uh, the SIGTARP has suggested dozens of ideas to us, and we look back and we, we've accepted, or uh, in, in a way very similar, uh, accepted the SIGTARP's recommendations about three-fourths of the time. There are some cases where we have determined that in the interest of uh, financial stability and because we can find other ways of protecting the taxpayer that uh, we, uh, de we decline to implement. And in one of these cases has been the creation of a wall. Now, in many cases, and here I draw upon 35 years' experience in the financial services industry, in many cases, it makes great sense to have a wall to separate asset managers in one area from asset managers in another. In the case of the asset managers we're hiring on behalf of the taxpayer, we want to have their best talent working for the American taxpayer in the PPIP fund. A lot of language there. Uh, PPIP is one I'll ask you about later. Uh, what, what, is your, what was your feeling? This is a man who's been enormously financially successful He's in the government, in the Treasury Department, and you're there. How, how can you have, you know, any power over him in the job that you were having? Well, I, I certainly didn't have any power over him. Um, all I really had was the, the power of the logic of our arguments. Uh, and, and what I learned over time um, from advice from others, uh, as well as just sort of figuring it out, was that, you know, I wasn't really going to be able to directly influence Treasury officials, whether it was Herb Allison or anyone else. Um, I could do my recommendations. And, you know, if they were sort of easy to implement, they would probably take them. You know, Herb mentioned in that piece that he that they did adopt a number of them, sometimes without putting up too much of a fight. But for the big issues, um, they tended to, at least initially, ignore us entirely. Um, so what I learned was that I had to use the press and Congress to try to get external pressure on Treasury to see what we were doing. And, and that clip was a great example. Um, on this is one of the TARP programs that we're rolling out that we identified as very significant problems. Um, so through our reports, uh, we would file quarterly reports to Congress, um, through interacting with the press to make sure that they understood what our issues were and trying to explain it to them in, in ways that were sort of easy to understand and, and digestible but accurate, um, we were able to get Congress engaged. And through my communications with Congress and, and being in constant uh, telephone and, and going up and down to the Hill as much as I can to help explaining our views, 
were able to get external pressure like you saw uh, during this hearing where members of Congress would put pressure on Treasury to better protect the taxpayer in some of these programs. What is SIG TARP? That, that was your title? The Special Inspector General for the Troubled Asset Relief Program. So when, when Congress passed uh, in 2008, the, the act that gave Treasury the ability to bail out the banks with $700 billion of taxpayer money, um, they also created this brand new entity called SIGTARP. And you know our role was to provide oversight. Part of that was by creating a brand new law enforcement agency. We we're like a mini FBI for the TARP to police the program and, and try to catch and deter criminals who are trying to steal from it. Um, and the second part was this oversight mechanism where we would do these reports to Congress every quarter and then special reports on special audits we would do of specific TARP programs. Where did you get your authority? Uh, from Congress, from this legislation. Uh, and it, it provided that we had um, all the authorities of any inspector general, um, which are these similar type oversight agencies that are attached to each department and, and many agencies within the federal government. You say in your book you weren't terribly impressed by a number of the inspectors general around the town. And how many are there? Do you have any idea? I think there's 64 or 65 different IGs. Um, well, one of the things, when I first came down to Washington, I didn't really know what an IG did. My experience was, as a prosecutor, we seldom, occasionally would run into their law enforcement arms. They would be our agents, and uh, for a while I was doing mortgage fraud cases. I'd started up a mortgage fraud unit, and I was dealing with the inspectors general from HUD, which were, which were very good law enforcement agents. Um, but I didn't really know the, the big picture of what an IG was doing. Um, and when I got the job, when I came down, one of the first things I did was go around and meet the different IGs. And starting with those meetings and really over the next couple of years, um, I found that the, the inspectors generals, or IGs as, as, as we call them, um, unfortunately, although they're supposed to be these fierce watchdogs looking out for waste, fraud, and abuse, those are the magic words that are written into their statute and what they're supposed to be doing, um, had really become or were often just like any other governmental agency. Uh, their number one concern seemed to be things about their budget, how to preserve their budget. Um, they were very worried about clashing with management. They were very worried about too much interactions with Congress. Um, and it was really a very much a go-along, get-along type of attitude uh, that what I kept hearing over and over again that there were three types of different IGs. Uh, a lapdog who would presumably curl up on the lap of management, and that was discouraged. Uh, a watchdog, which was sort of in between, and, and a junkyard dog. Uh, and I think ultimately, when I was going through the confirmation process, I was told by, by Senator Baucus, uh, who was um, the head of the Finance Committee, which is, oversaw one of my, my confirmation hearings, that I needed to be like a, a junkyard dog. Uh, but the IGs were telling me that I, I shouldn't be too aggressive and should be more like that, that watchdog. Unfortunately, in practice, it seemed often that IGs were more concerned about keeping their job and not being offensive um, than necessarily being that strong advocate for the taxpayer that they're supposed to be. Well, quick question. Uh, 64 inspectors general, does the public get its money's worth? Sometimes. Uh, I think that there are, there are some IGs who, who do their job well. Um, there are some, and usually those are the ones that you, you hear about in the news. Uh, when Glenn Fine was the DOJ, the Inspector General Department of Justice, he helped use his office to really lead the investigation into the politically motivated firings of, of U.S. attorneys. I mean, that's an example of an extremely aggressive, very effective IG. Uh, often, you don't hear about them, know about them. Uh, I was once asked a question about why a particular agency didn't have an IG doing what we were doing, and it turned out that they did. It's just that you never heard of them because um, they're, they're so not out there. They're so not aggressive. I, I was once told by an IG point blank that he wished he could do what I was doing, but he was afraid for his job, that he had kids in college and he, had, he couldn't afford to lose his job. And that's one of the problems. They, they live in fear of being fired if they're too, uh, too, ag too aggressive uh, in carrying out their duties. Quick background update. You went to undergraduate school where? Uh, University of Pennsylvania. Studied what? Uh, I got a degree in international relations and then in economics from the business school. Graduated what year? 92. Got your law degree from what school? New York University School of Law, 95. And you're back there now teaching law. I am. You were born where? Uh, Abington, Pennsylvania. Grew up where? Lived in that area, also in New York, Minnesota, and ultimately my family went to South Florida. Mom and dad, what did they do? Um, in Florida, they had a small travel agency. Married, when did you get married, and how many children do you have? I'm married on 8808. Uh, specifically so I could never forget it, uh, and have two kids. Uh, one's about 
two years, four months. The other one's about four months. How long were you a prosecutor in the Southern District of uh, New York? Eight years. What did you basically prosecute? I, I started doing narcotics and then doing international narcotics for a number of years. I then switched over to securities fraud. And ultimately, when I was hired, I'd recently started up a mortgage fraud group. You spent how long in Washington, in the government, in the Treasury Department? Uh, 27 months. Starting what day? I started on December 15th, 2008, and I stepped down on March 30th, 2011. In the process of oversight and all, here is Senator Richard Shelby talking to you about what you should be doing in your job. And this is a very important job that you occupy, Special Inspector General of this TARP program. A, a lifetime a, a opportunity of public service that very few people ever have to do right. And you might be unemployable after you do this, <laughs> but you know and I know that, that these people have got to fear you and your office. If they don't fear you, they're going to play with you. They're going to deny you this, and they're going to deny you this. Senator Dodd wanted to know, wants you to tell this committee what you need at all time. If somebody's stifling you, we want to know. What kind of money did that Congress give you to spend in your job? Well, it was original, original outlay of $50 million. For how long? Um, basically until we ran out of it. Um, and then when we went back, then we'd have to go through the normal uh, budgetary process through Treasury and the White House to get additional funds. Uh, but I will say, in this sort of age of, of, of a lot of agencies getting denied funding, we never had a problem. Um, we were always more than adequately funded. Um, and, you know, Senator Shelby kept good on his promise, as did Congress, to make sure that not only did we always have the adequate resources to do our job, uh, but that type of support and backing, um, which was absolutely instrumental. Um, especially from both parties. We had the Republicans, as, as you could see from, from Senator Shelby, but also from the Democrats, probably even more importantly from the Democrats once the uh, Obama administration took over, that they also strongly supported what we were doing and helped keep the pressure up on Treasury. Senator Jim Bunning, former senator uh, from Kentucky, had this to say to you during the confirmation process. The bailout law also allows $50 million for your office. And so you will have a very ample amount of resources. But I have serious concerns with your nomination. The nominee may be a dedicated public servant. He appears to be a skilled prosecutor and a man of integrity. But I wonder why taxpayers should have to pay $50 million to a watchdog who will have nothing to watch. Ultimately, I believe Mr. Borowski with his impressive legal skills, could serve the public far better in the Southern District of New York, where he can continue to prosecute mortgage fraud. Where was Senator Bunning coming from? Well, I think this Senator Bunning was, was very much opposed to TARP in the first place, the, the whole legislation. Um, and I think he was uncomfortable with creating yet another new federal agency with, as he said, a $50 million budget. Um, and look, it's, that's an understandable concept. There's a lot of people out there who similarly feel that, that more government agencies is not the solution. Um, I will say, though, eventually we brought Senator Bunning over to our side. He, he eventually co-sponsored a bill that um, expanded our power and jurisdiction. And uh, one of the most remarkable things is at a hearing towards right before he stepped down, he actually said I did a pretty good job, uh, which from, for Senator Bunning, from what I understand, it was, was a pretty remarkable compliment. So, so I think he was coming from, from an understandable place, given what we've seen in government. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as an agency, we, we more than paid for ourselves many times over. Um, just in one case, we kept more than a half a billion dollars uh, from going out into an ongoing fraud um, because of our investigative function. So, What does um, it say to the American people that we need 64 inspectors general and that we had to have a $50 million expense to keep people honest inside the government that we elect? Well, I would say with respect to this program, um, it was extremely necessary. And the reason why is when you have a program like this, which is designed at, at its outset to bail out banks and, and help Wall Street institutions, the people running that program within Treasury all came from the same mindset. And this was the same when it was Hank Paulson's Treasury Department under President Bush and continued under President Obama with, with Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner. You had people who all came at the problems with a Wall Street perspective. 
their biggest concern over and over again was protecting the banks, protect, and what they saw by protecting the banks, protecting a financial system. But they didn't have people who were sensitive to the issues of the fact that if you're shoveling hundreds of billions of dollars out, you have real vulnerabilities to fraud. Um, there's going to be those who are going to try to steal that money. Um, they're not as attuned to conflicts of interest. They're not really, they weren't really cognizant of the fact that you needed a degree of skepticism uh, with the people and the institutions that they were interacting. Um, so our role, and I think what the role of, of all IG should be, is to be that voice of the taxpayer, to be that, that, that institutional um, concept of, of pushing back when, when money's being pushed out with not enough, not enough strings attached, um, when there are potential vulnerabilities to fraud that, frankly, if you have a career at Goldman Sachs, you're not really going to be sensitive to when you're pushing this money out. And one of the things I saw over and over again was this sort of presumption of goodness um, that these banks and these executives would never, ever, ever take advantage of, of the taxpayer uh, by putting their profit interest over that of the public interest. And, and I think our voice was one of skepticism to help try to rein that back in. You prosecuted somebody by the name of Antonucci? Yes. Who was he and what happened to that prosecution? So Antonucci was essentially the CEO of a smallish bank in New York um, that tried to get TARP money by cooking its books, um, committing a type of accounting fraud by um, essentially making it look like they had more bank capital, which is basically the cushion that a bank has against losses. Uh, it's what stands between a bank from failing if it has a certain number of losses or being able to withstand that impact through, through, through their own shareholders. Um, and Antonucci had, had engaged in some trickery to make it look like the bank was more healthy than it was as, as to try to get, I think it was, I don't remember the exact amount, maybe $11 million of taxpayer funds. Um, and we worked with the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York to investigate him, uh, to prosecute him, and I think ultimately he, he pleaded guilty to those charges. Here, here's a list of all the acronyms that uh, you use in your book. I listened to your book in, uh, in the car while I was traveling, and you got used to hearing TARP, SIGTARP, HAMP, RMBS, CDO, PPIP, TALF, CPB, CPP, and SIGR. Um, how does how does the average person understand what all those mean? Well, we, if you have a hard copy, we have we had a handy dandy glossary, uh, which helps uh, uh, which helps uh, explain these different terms. Um, but look, it's government, and there's an alphabet soup in, in government. Uh, I really tried in the book to to make it as understandable, but unfortunately, sometimes just conversationally and trying to recount, especially recounting the conversations that we had, you know, we would not refer to the Home Affordable Modification Program as, as that. We refer to it as HAMP. Um, so we try to explain it in the book as much detail as we can. What was HAMP or what is HAMP? So HAMP was the, the program that the Obama administration launched uh, to try to meet the original requirement that Congress put forward that TARP be used not just to help the banks by bailing them out, uh, but also do something about the foreclosure crisis that was raging in 2008. Uh, and Congress insisted when they gave Treasury the authority to go bail out the banks that it also do something from homeowners. Uh, and that program was launched, announced with the intention to help up to 4 million people stay in their homes. Uh, unfortunately, it's fallen far, far short of that goal. How many has it helped? I think it's around 800,000 now, about 20% of that goal. And in the book, we talk a lot about the program design flaws, uh, but also some of the intentions behind the program that, and recount sort of conversations that I had with, with Secretary Geithner um, and others, that the program was really more about helping the banks survive the crisis than it was necessarily trying to get 4 million people to stay in their homes. How much politics was played with HAMP? Oh, a, a tremendous amount of politics um, in the way that they fought back against some of those recommendations that we had made to, to try to deal with the, the foreclosure crisis head on, um, later to how they, they defined success under the program. Uh, just a very quick example, they originally set up to 4 million people would get help by the program. Um, when it became pretty obvious that they were never going to come anywhere near, they said, oh, no, no, that was never our intent. Our intent was just to make 4 million offers. Uh, whether people accepted those offers and whether those modifications were actually uh, successful and people actually stayed in their homes, that was never really part of what we wanted to do. That was sort of one example of how politicized the program became. Now, as a Democrat all your life, you're sitting in this job first in the George Bush administration. Uh, what was the feeling that you had with Hank Paulson and what did you think of him? And then the feeling you had with Tim Geithner when uh, President Obama came in. Um, there was really, I think I, I had anticipated a major change because of the political differences. Um, but substantively, there was 
almost no difference. Um, the, that level of deference to the banks and putting the banks first was really the same under the Paulson administration as it was under the Geithner administration. On a personal level, I, the two were very different. Um, Paulson was very welcoming. Uh, he swore me in my first day. He had sent a message out to the Treasury Department that he wanted to make it work with SIGTARP. Uh, he was very solicitous of, of what I thought about the my first day. They were, they were just about to put the money into the auto industry um, and what thoughts we had and, and agreed in concept with a lot of the ideas we had to protect taxpayer money. Um, Geithner was much more dismissive. Um, I didn't really meet with him all that often, maybe a couple of meetings. Um, at times, he was very combative, at times very aggressive, at times profane. Um, so I think stylistically there was, a, there was a difference. But substantively, unfortunately, we really saw a lot of the same, which was pushing back on what we thought were pretty common sense approaches to protect the taxpayers and bring more transparency. Put this into the equation. Here's Elizabeth Warren in a hearing questioning Tim Geithner. If you look at where the government acted, had to act early in substantial force in some of the largest and weakest part of the system, in that context, both in the context of Fannie and Freddie and the context of AIG, we were very clear that the conditions in that context came with changes in board and management for exactly the reasons you said. Now, there's also, there's been... I, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure I'm following. You're saying that there have been changes in management? Where the government like the acted... financial institutions Absolutely. that have received TARP funds? Well, as, as I said, in the context of... Uh, the interventions taken in Fannie and Freddie and AIG, just to cite three I, examples. I'm asking about the financial institutions. Well, those, those are financial institutions. I'm asking about the uh, banks. But the principle is important in this case. And I, as I said, the president said this publicly, I've said it publicly. Going forward, where institutions need exceptional levels of assistance, we will make sure that assistance comes with conditions that provide for the necessary degree of accountability, help ensure these firms emerge stronger rather than weaker. What did you see there? I saw the classic refusal to answer a question. Um, and look, we, we saw this over and over again in these hearings. I mean, what Elizabeth Warren was asking is, in the, when you rescued the banks, was there any change in management? And Geithner's response was, well, over here at AIG and over here at Fannie and Freddie. And she came back a couple of times as she would do at these hearings. Um, but he wouldn't answer the question because the answer to the question was obviously no. They didn't compel the change uh, of the leadership of, of the big banks. They, they kept their jobs. Uh, they kept their bonuses. They kept the rich compensation they received prior to their bailouts. They kept those bonuses were soon restored for those executives. Um, and rather than answer that question, you, you sort of get this very classic Washington bob and weave, um, which is you know a practiced art in, in this town, to be honest with you, of not directly answering a question. But the average person watching, they, their head must be spinning. Uh, we live here and they're spinning. You've got Elizabeth Warren sitting in a Senate hearing room, she's not a senator, questioning yeah. the secretary, I know, <laughs> secretary of the treasury. Uh, and you all, you all are really all Democrats, all a part of an administration of sorts. What role did she play? And you, you had a lot of lunches with her during your time when you were the uh, uh, SIG TARP. So she was the head of another oversight entity that was created in that same TARP legislation called the Congressional Oversight Panel. Um, and so Congress wanted to have its own eyes and ears and created this special entity uh, to provide another level of oversight. Um, and this was a body of, of five panelists, um, three Democrats, two Republicans, and Elizabeth was named its, its chair. Um, so we had different roles in providing oversight. So we were, on, on the one hand, inside of the Treasury Department. We were part of the executive branch. Um, and a lot of our job was, was helping with program formation as well as our law enforcement goal. Um, they had more of a congressional type of role, which is why they had the ability to call hearings um, and take testimony and, and try to bring transparency in that way. And I think they took more of an academic approach in analyzing the programs, more from an after-the-fact perspective. But the public says, why? we've got 100 United States senators, why can't they oversee this? Why do you need to bring another entity into the process? You know, I think that they brought a very specialized skill. Um, you had on, on the panel, you had some members of Congress initially, uh, but you also had a professor like Elizabeth Warren. You had sort of other experts, and they were able to, to call through their own budget, um, bringing you know, a, a pretty impressive array of experts to, towards different issues. I mean, could Congress have done it? Probably. Um, but I think with this level of specificity and depth, um, which they did in their reports, I don't think you would normally see that from a congressional. What does it mean that Hank Paulson, Secretary of the Treasury, had been ahead of Goldman Sachs, and that Tim Geithner, Secretary of the Treasury, had been ahead of the New York Fed. 
What does all that mean? And if you're outside looking in, is that good for us or bad for us as a public? Well, I think there's good things and there are bad things about it. Um, the good thing is that when you're in the midst of a financial crisis, um, there is some benefit to having folks who come from these Wall Street institutions. Um, obviously, Goldman Sachs is a Wall Street institution, the de very definition of one. Um, and the New York Fed, as a regulator that sits in New York City, um, deals on a daily basis with the very large commercial banks. Um, commercial banks sit on, sit on, sat on Tim Geithner's board, for example, Jamie Dimon of, of J.P. Morgan Chase. Let, let me ask you a question about the New York Fed. If I worked at the New York Fed, would I get a check from the federal government? You know, it's, it's an interesting question that even the New York Fed isn't very clear about. So the Federal Reserve is very much part of the federal government. The New York Fed is this quasi-public-private institution. Like They'll assert in their litigation when they're trying to beat back um, disclosure requirements under the Freedom of Information Act, they'll say that they're a private, co they're a private corporation. Uh, but obviously, they're very much involved in carrying out public policy. So I, I, don't, I think the check probably says New York Fed. Um, and they're funded by dues that they collect from the banks uh, within their district, as well as money that they, they earn um, from, from do, covering out very much governmental function. And that's sort of an interesting problem, I think, with, with, with the system, is that it's not entirely clear, but mostly they serve a gov a primarily a government function, I would say. All right, you are going to serve the same role that Bill Burke did for you. With somebody coming to you now and saying, I've just been asked to go in to pick your future crisis to be an inspector general, what advice would you give them? What would you warn them about? <laughs> Stay home. <laughs> that might be my first one. Uh, but if you do go in, you know, understand that you're going to, and it's something I, I did not appreciate, um, a political minefield that you, you really can't imagine. Um, you know, bailouts were very politicized, of course, going in, and it only became more so. And every aspect of a, of a crisis, and any type of crisis-like institution, um, there's going to be tremendous amount of political pressure on you from all sides to shape your job, shape your reports, how you approach what you do. Um, you know, I was constantly told about things that I shouldn't be doing that were outside of my role. I wasn't supposed to get involved in policy decisions. I wasn't supposed to get involved in program formation. Um, I wasn't supposed to talk to the media. Uh, all of these things, you're going to hear all of this advice. Um, but ultimately, go back to your statute and see what, what created you and what your job are, uh, what your job is, and, and stick to what you're supposed to do. Ignore all the political noise and do the job that the, you know, that the, if you're presidentially appointed, the president appointed you to do and you're supposed to do, um, which is to ferret out waste, fraud, and abuse and represent um, the taxpayer to the best you can. All right, in 2008, you report for duty. First of all, what is TARP? Okay, so TARP stands for the Troubled Asset Relief Program. And the original idea behind TARP was as, when well, we were in 2008 and the banks were just hemorrhaging losses. Huge, huge amounts of losses, uh, mostly coming from bets on real estate. Uh, the, our, we had a huge bubble in this country in, in housing, and a lot of the banks had a lot of exposures through a lot of very complex financial instruments. But the very simplest way of doing it, of looking at it, is that housing went down, and it took a lot of the banks who had exposure to housing, had investments in housing, down with them, and that created all sorts of runs on the banks and, and a general crisis. And the original idea of TARP was that it was going to buy these assets, these real estate-related assets, these bonds that were made up of bunches of mortgages, and then these other bonds that were made up of a bunch of other bonds to get to be really complicated. Um, and the government was going to buy them from the banks to try to stop the bleeding and bring back some degree of, of financial stability. That's what a lot of members of Congress thought they were voting for when they voted for TARP. Well, let me ask you, an R what's an RMBS? I, you kept talking about that in your book. So an RMBS is, is what is called a residential mortgage-backed security. Um, and in simplest terms, the way to think about it is that in the run-up to the crisis and, and even before that, um, financial institutions would take a whole bunch of mortgages and put them, bundle them together into a bond. And people would buy different parts of the bond. And when people would invest in the bond, they would be getting a claim to each of the monthly payments that, that everyone who has a mortgage behind that bond uh, would make. So that's thousands and thousands of mortgages get put into one bond. And people invest in that by buying these bonds, which give them a right to those flows of income. Those are called mortgage-backed securities because it's the mortgage that backs the bond. And the R is because those are home mortgages as opposed to other types of mortgages. Do we still have them? 
we still have them. They're still there. Uh, but the, really, the private market for them, where the where Wall Street was putting them together, has almost disappeared. Right now, it's almost entirely government funded through government entities. What is PPIP? PPIP is that public private investment program that Herb Allison was talking about uh, uh, moments ago. This was originally envisioned, as Secretary Geithner explained it, to be a trillion dollar program that was going to help ultimately buy those same toxic assets. Um, when After TARP was passed, the money wasn't used to buy the bonds. It was used to plug the holes in the banks directly by buying shares of their stocks, increasing their, their capital, their ability to withstand future losses. So the PPIP was an idea of marrying up Treasury money with private money, as well as Federal Reserve money, a very complex program, uh, to try to recreate that idea of buying these, these these RMBS, these mortgage bonds, um, and other things that were created from them, um, uh, ultimately the program was, was, was a failure, and I think it's maybe 20 to 30 billion actually got spent. What's a CDO? A CDO is that bond of bonds, if you will. Um, it's, a, it's got a collateralized debt obligation, uh, but these were really some of the, the, the toxic, when people talk about troubled and toxic assets, this is what they were talking about. Um, because they would take a whole bunch of mortgage bonds and package them together and then sell a right to buy pieces of that bond. And if that sounds hopelessly complex, it is. Um, You're talking about the different levels, the tranches? Yes. But, but it, is that a bad deal if, if you're outside looking in as an average citizen to buy a CDO? Um, ultimately, because of the way they were created. Um, they were created with some of the most poorly performing mortgages, some of the riskiest mortgages, mortgages that were riddled with fraud because uh, the banks that were putting them together didn't really care about whether the performance was because they were just selling them off to investors. Um, and these really all got concentrated in these CDOs. Um, and when these CDOs blew up, uh, they took the financial system down with them. One more, TALF, T-A-L-F. Okay. So this is another government program, also part of TARP, also part of a Federal Reserve program uh, called the Term Asset Backed Securities Lending Facility. And what it tried to do, uh, again, with moderate success, was to try to bring back um, a whole other way that a lot of consumer loans in this country get funded, um, things like auto loans and student loans, um, different other types of, 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 of loans that would get bundled up in other types of securities, the other types of bonds. And the Tau program came along to try to restart that market. Here's Senator Tom Carper from a hearing talking about the GM bailout. With, with respect to the, uh, the auto, uh, the auto companies, uh, GM and Chrysler, my recollection was that uh, GM uh, made uh, some repayments of, I want to say, six or seven billion dollars. I was some uh, assertion I heard they were sort of like taking money out of one pocket and, and, and sort of like paying Peter with Paul's money. Is, can, can you just re refresh my memory on that? Ultimately, every part of the $49.5 billion was we received equity in return, part of it was preferred shares, and part of it was a approximately $7 billion loan. That loan was repaid by money that came out of that TARP escrow account. Okay. So the money had gone over to GM, so it was in GM's possession as part of the bailout, but it was a segregated account of TARP funds. Again, taking a deep breath as a layman uh, when you see this, how are we supposed to understand this? And in the end, what's the deal on GM? Was the bailout the right thing to do? Did they really pay their loans off? Yeah, this is sort of an example, I think, of the government uh, and the Treasury Department taking a, a perfectly good story and then trying to make it look a lot better than it was for PR purposes, for political purposes. Um, and as a result, you end up with this confused mess that ultimately seems a little bit misleading. So what had happened here is that GM had paid back part of its loan. And look, we're still on the hook for tens of billions of dollars for, for, for General Motors. We own shares of their stock. Uh, but another part of the ballot was through a, was through a loan. Uh, but ultimately, when they repaid that loan, which was, which was made with big announcements from the White House and from the Treasury Department, um, they used other TARP money that they had received as part of the bailout for, from, you know, from some of that stock that we have and used it to pay off the loan. Um, so it was good news that they paid back the loan. That was a lot of TARP money sitting around that they didn't need in order to keep the company afloat, and they used it to pay back the loan. So that was a good thing. But they didn't really disclose where the money came from, and they made it sound like it came from just selling a bunch of cars. They had all this cash, and they paid back their loan. 
hey, look, part of my job was to rain on the parade a little bit uh, and clarify that where this money was coming from and bringing that level of transparency. But I think we saw that a lot in, in TARP, and I think we see that a lot in government taking something that is good news, GM didn't need the money that we originally gave it and was able to pay down its loan, and try to turn it into something else. As to the bigger question, um, look, you know, it's, it's very hard to, you know, to say what would have happened had we not bailed out GM and Chrysler. Um, you know, the estimates of the job losses are, are all over the map. Um, all I know is from my own experience, being in Hank Paulson's office on my first day, December 15, 2008, and him telling me that if they didn't use TARP funds to bail out GM and Chrysler, that it, those, those institutions are going to go bankrupt and, dis and disappear. Um, and the impact on our economy at that time, um, I think, was too frightening to contemplate. So I think it was probably the right call. You talk about your, your first couple of days and paint that picture, if you would, again, of where your office was located, what it looked like, what you found when you got there, and the Secretary of the Treasury and Mr. Allison's office and the uh, Inspector General of the Treasury Department. What, what was the difference? It was so comical. As I went through my interview process, uh, I went to different offices around the Treasury Department. I saw uh, Eric Thorson, the IG of Treasury, who had this sort of remarkable four offices combined to one with this sweeping views of the White House. Um, I saw the different Treasury officials. One looked like the general counsel looked like a museum. And it actually was like a roped off part of the tour of, of the Treasury Department. And then after my meeting, I got sworn in by, by Secretary Paulson, had this really remarkable meeting. Uh, they said, OK, we're going to take you to your office. And we just kept walking down the stairs and down the stairs and down the stairs. And eventually, this hit by the smell of bacon and eggs, because we're right next to the Treasury cafeteria. And we walk into this sort of very dismal, grungy basement office where um, we had this, this smell, I'll never forget, sort of hit us right as we opened the door, uh, which was there for months. It, we later found out it was actually an open sewage pipe right underneath the office. Um, and instead of these like palatial views of the White House, all we had were some gated, I call them Laverne and Shirley-like windows, it, these, these gated windows right by the, the top of the office where you could see sort of the ankles of people walking by. Um, look, you know, I'd come from a pretty dilapidated 70s style building from Manhattan. Uh, when I was at the U.S. Attorney's Office, so I've been sort of used to uh, modest accommodations. Uh, but it was quite a contrast seeing what the palatial offices that are reserved for what, what's known in Washington as presidentially appointed Senate-confirmed officials, and then seeing where they, they, they had dumped us uh, into the basement. So you in your office, and, and you try to get a meeting with Tim Geithner, and you've had a couple, and you talk about in the book, you go from your office to a very nice office, and a man who is Secretary of the Treasury. First of all, and does he have any say over your life when you're in that job as Inspector General? Well, that was actually a big point of contention. Um, the, with the way we viewed the statute and the way Congress wrote the bill, made it very clear, in our view, that we were an independent agency uh, within the Treasury Department, which meant that um, essentially the President of the United States had the ultimate authority over me. He could fire me at will, didn't need to have any reasons or cause, could just basically a stroke of his pen. Uh, but that ultimately we operated independent of any supervision from the Treasury Secretary. Um, they didn't like that. They went to the Department of Justice and actually sought to get a ruling uh, that I was under his supervision, which would have given the secretary uh, potentially the ability and the authority to shut down audits he didn't like, shut down investigations he didn't like, keep me from releasing certain reports. Um, you know, we ended up fighting tooth and nail using some of our friends in Congress to help push back on that, and ultimately they walked away from that fight. Uh, but ultimately, no, they didn't have, after they withdrew that request, they didn't have that authority. Your most contentious moment with Tim Geithner? So we had a meeting I had asked for. Um, Essentially, it was after Treasury had refused almost for a full year to require TARP banks to report on how they were using their funds. And that was, we thought that was a real failure in transparency. And there had been other transparency failures that had followed. And I wanted this meeting to try to personally impress upon him, because I had been saying it to, to Herb Allison and his predecessor and everyone else who had listened, but I hadn't had a chance to voice it to the secretary, that they're really doing themselves harm. Uh, doing the country harm and doing the president harm because there was this perception out there that thought bailouts were just a giant transfer of wealth from the taxpayer to a handful of executives. And the secrecy, by not being more transparent, was, was, was fueling a degree of cynicism um, that could have really lasting impact on the ability of our country to govern itself. Um, and I really wanted to make an impassioned plea that he needed to reverse these policies and be more transparent. 
Um, and as I laid that case out to him um, and explained to him that he was not being sufficiently transparent, uh, the meeting got very contentious. Uh, he, to put it mildly, disagreed with my contention. Um, he used um, you know, a lot of obscenities in expressing his view that he had been one of the most transparent secretaries of the Treasury in the history of the country, that he had forced the banks to disclose things that no one else would. Um, and it sort of followed this pattern for about 40 minutes of, of really very uh, explosive, obscenity-laden tirades against me uh, as I was sort of trying to make that argument. And let me be clear, I'm not complaining about that. It's just sort of the nature of, of, of a very contentious meeting. But still inside, I'm still just a line prosecutor uh, from Manhattan. And all of a sudden, I've got one of the most powerful officials in the world you know, dropping F-bombs on me. Um, and it was sort of this, this very remarkable moment. And uh, my deputy who had come with me from, from New York, Kevin Pawlowski, after us just looked at each other. And it was sort of just a remarkable thing that here we are trying to advocate for what we think is some pretty common sense changes. Um, and this deep level of animosity um, and condescension uh, was was somewhat remarkable. Now you were thirty nine when you took the job. Thirty eight. Thirty eight. You're kid. today. Are you forty one? Forty two. Forty two. And how old was Tim Geithner? Uh, I'm not sure. I think he just turned fifty. I think I read somewhere. Is he a lawyer? No. But if I were in his shoes and I'm sitting there in the office, I would say to myself, I'm the Secretary of the Treasury. This guy. He's just a former prosecutor. I'm the big, I'm in the cabinet. He's just a guy down near the kitchen downstairs smelling the, the, uh, the pipes underneath. Why should I put up with his nonsense? Well, that's clearly what he thought. But, you know, I just go back to how Secretary Paulson approached the job, uh, who understood that as a prosecutor um, and as, as someone who was not of outside of that Wall Street bubble, who Paulson and then later Geithner completely surrounded himself with people from Goldman Sachs, from Bear Stearns, from Merrill Lynch, um, from those banks, that an outside perspective, uh, especially one that's very sensitive to the issues of fraud and abuse, I mean, that, that came from my background, that that's a valid voice to hear. Um, and even if you disagree with that voice, even if you think that voice is wrong, it's still valid to get that input so you get something to pierce the echo chamber of these pro-Wall Street-centric voices What's uh, his that motive? surround themselves. What's the, Tim Geithner's motive in the, all this? He's, he's not going to continue as Secretary of Treasury no matter what, I guess. See, I, I don't even want to speculate on his motives, but I, I, what I can comment on is on his ideology. And it really reflects that Wall Street ideology, this sense that what's best for the banks is best for the country, these, these top banks. Um, so when the banks were telling him that more transparency would be dangerous, and the things that I heard was that more transparency, things like having them account for how they spent the money, um, could you know be easy to game, it could be dangerous, could take down TAR, could take down the banking system. Um, I think he accepted those voices from Wall Street really without questioning them. And I was trying to give him counter arguments and lay out examples of how these things could get done. Um, it was completely invalid. And I think that's a real sense in the, regulator, the regulators in Treasury. If you're not among those bankers, um, you really have no business having an opinion. Who is Tim Massad? Tim Massad is the current Herb Allison successor. So he was, he worked with Herb when, as the chief counsel for TARP. Um, and then he, when, when Herb Allison stepped down in, I think it was early October of 2010, he took over. Here's a protocol issue that you write about in your book between Tim Massad and yourself at a hearing. Let's watch. As is the customs of this committee, we would ask that your full written statements be placed in the record and that you limit your opening statements as close as possible to five minutes. As was the custom of my predecessor, you will, uh, you will see three lights. Green means continue to go. Yellow is the warning that you should not run through our intersection. And red, in all 50 states, means stop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The normal rule of committee is that we go in, in order of, of rank. Uh, Mr. Massad, I believe uh, you would, by protocol, be first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We don't go on with the testimony, uh, but what rankled you about that moment? So when I, came to, when I came to Washington, I didn't give a fig leaf about protocol. I didn't really understand it, usually violated it. Um, under protocol, I was a presidentially appointed Senate-confirmed official. Uh, at the time, Mr. Massad was an acting, which means he was not presidentially confirmed, which meant by any degree of protocol, I should have gone first. And the funny thing now is I saw red. 
And I was so upset at this slight uh, that I had imagined uh, that afterwards I went to my, my legislative director and said, you need to tell, and I used my own salty language, you know, you need to tell his staffer that, I, that there's 100 senators who say that I outrank him and that this was ICE's first hearing, that he's got to understand the basic rules of protocol. And I went home that, that night and told my wife about it. And she just burst out laughing. And she's basically, what's wrong with you? Like, what's happened to you? And I looked at it, and I started explaining, and I realized, my god, she was right. And it was that, literally that night, I started working on my letter of resignation, because this is part of the influence of Washington and, and of power. I had so much become part of this system that I had abhorred when I came there that I was now getting upset about something as trivial and stupid about who testifies first. Um, but it was, it was, at that point, I was thinking about stepping down. I think this was in January of 2011. Um, and that really solidified it for me, that I was becoming part of the, the very mechanisms of power that I had so detested when I first got there. You say a lot of good things about your deputy. He appeared on one of our call-in shows. Let's watch. Uh, and if you add all of those programs up and assume that every program was fully subscribed at the same time, um, you get a total amount of, of support uh, from the government of $23.7 trillion. Um, we've made it clear in the report that we're not suggesting that's $23.7 trillion worth of, uh, of potential loss. Uh, some of these programs involve a significant amount of collateral. Some of the programs have been discontinued or, and some of the money has been repaid. But if you simply look at all 50 programs and what the government has said um, is the total amount of support available under these programs, if you add it up, it's $23.7 trillion. Is there any way to make this simple to understand? $23.7 trillion, who can understand that? It, the number is so big that it almost defies understanding. But it is, it, I mean, the way to understand it is that when we had a financial crisis, um, the government was in a full-blown panic. I mean, there's really no other way to, to explain it. I mean, they were worried about the next Great Depression, um, and they threw the kitchen sink at the financial system. Uh, they made promises and guarantees um, across the board, and almost in anything that you can imagine to help support the largest financial institutions to keep them from failing. And that included the $700 billion, which is the 0.7 in that number, but it also included these wide array of guarantees. And if you add them all up, the number comes to 23.7. And that includes things like, just as an example, you know, more than $3 trillion to guarantee um, all the money market funds. Now, all the money market funds weren't all going to fail at once, but the significance is the government said, even if they did, we'd put up three point something trillion dollars. And it was adding up those different programs, which give a sense of the total level of commitment. And we thought it was very important to get that number out there, because this was at the very beginning of the regulatory reform debate. And we thought it was important for Congress to know, the American people to know. And frankly, I wanted to know. I didn't know what that total number was when you add them all up. And no government agency had done so. So they can understand just how broken our financial system was and just how extraordinary the government's response had to be. Um, but it, it, it actually, Kevin was, was giving that response because it had created this huge controversy. The number had gotten twisted out of, out of context so that we were saying that we were going to lose $23 trillion, which is Kevin ably described, we never said. Um, but it, we, and I think what was probably most surprising was the attacks that we got from the White House and the Treasury Department who we actually naively thought would be really supportive of the idea of painting a picture of how extraordinary the bailouts were. But that was definitely not the case. You hired a Chris Belisle from SIGGER, which is another one of those acronyms, the gentleman, Stuart Bowen, who ran the inspector general for Iraq. <clears throat> Why did you hire her? What was the reason? <clears throat> you know, she came in when I was interviewing for, you know, when I started off, it was just me and Kevin. We were two people, and we had an agency. And I realized that we needed to have a press person. I had already realized that I had no idea how to deal with the media. Um, and I'd gotten good advice that I should hire a press person. Uh, and when Chris came in to interview, it was like she was explaining a whole netherworld that I had no idea existed, which is the world of press flax in Washington. And the first thing she said to me was, I'm not going to lie for you. I was like, I never asked you to lie for me. Uh, and I asked her what she was talking about. And she really explained how, how the press works and how um, she believed it was very important for this agency, as a new agency, uh, to be completely upfront with the media, to never spin, never do a lot of the tactics that a lot of agencies do, which is 
off the record or on background, which means telling the press something but not putting your name behind it, which is one of us. One of the great tactics in this town is that people will say, because you could say anything when your name's not attached to it. You can lie. You can make things up. You can exaggerate. Um, and she was basically saying that we're not going to play any of the, if, if I were to hire her, we're not going to play any of those games. We're going to be straightforward. We're going to tell the truth. Uh, we're going to expose when we make mistakes, and we did make mistakes, and we're going to admit them. Uh, and her strategy, and it was a strategy, it wasn't just being kind-hearted, was that we were going to build up so much credibility with the media, with Congress, um, that when we were under attack, and she saw that we would eventually be attacked, I, I didn't really think of that back in December of 2008, that we would have had this, this level of credibility that we could use to fight back. Uh, and I was ready to hire her on the spot. I'd never met anyone like her. I never heard of these things that I, that I saw, but all that made perfect sense to me. In the end, how many people worked for you? Uh, I think when I stepped down, we were around 120 or 130. Is there still, still a SIG TARP? There is. It will continue as long as Treasury has some outstanding assets that it has purchased under the program. But we've been given the impression that the TARP money's been paid back. Well, a lot of the TARP money hasn't been paid back. Um, has or hasn't? Has not. Um, we still have um, you know, exposure to AIG, to General Motors. I think there's still hundreds of banks that have not repaid their TARP funds. Uh, we still have that, that HAMP program is still limping along. Uh, it's now at a, a glacial pace. I think it's like eight or 12,000 uh, a month that are getting added. But that's still an active program. Um, have the big banks paid all their money back? The largest banks have, have mostly paid back. Uh, Ally Financial is a big bank that we that still owes a, a ton of TARP money. That's old GMAC. Old GMAC. All right, this book, Bailout, <clears throat> um, who do you want to read this and what will give you the most satisfaction? What kind of person? Um, I want everyone who votes <laughs> to read this book. I want people who understand and you know who care about the financial system and what's happened to our government. I want them to read this book because there's so much anger out there. Um, Are you angry? Oh, I'm furious uh, and, and I'm still angry. Um, and it's part of the reason why I wrote this book is, is to express that anger. But there's an anger out there that people understand and kind of get that Washington isn't being run for them, but it's being run for the interest of these financial elites, this small group of, of, of too big to fail banks and their executives who've, whose welfare has been put before the American people time and time again. They understand that on the left, on the Occupy, they understand that right on, on Tea Party, and a lot of other folks understand that in between. Um, but oftentimes, they're sort of derided as, as crazy or conspiracy theorists. I mean, I wrote this book so I could give them the evidence for their anger, the stories, the anecdotes, the individual things. Um, and I tried to do is try to bring the reader along with me um, as I went to Washington and sort of sit by me as you hear the things that these officials say uh, and the policies that they implemented. Um, so those are the people I want to see so they can understand that their anger is justified. And frankly, for people who aren't angry, I want to make them a little bit angry. When New York University hired you for the law school, did they give you tenure? No, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an adjunct, which right. means I, I teach classes and I'm a senior fellow, which means I work on some research stuff, but I'm not, a, I'm not a full professor there. But when you wrote this book, you had to sit down and think about what would happen to you later. I mean, do you ever expect to be hired again? For, by a government agency uh, because of this book? You know, it's, it goes back to that conversation I had with Herb Allison, which saying, if you don't change your tone, uh, it's, or what Senator Shelby said, you know, being ever employed again. And, you know, I, I did think about that. I think part of the struggle I had in, in deciding whether to write this book or not were the fact that it's going to blow up some bridges. It's going to uh, make, close off certain career paths. Uh, Anybody called you and said, I don't like your book? No. No. I've gotten a lot of people saying that they did like the book, but I haven't, I haven't heard from anyone. Um, who will like it the least? Well, I think the people who are exposed. Um, so I think that if you're a, an executive at a too-big-to-fail bank, you're not going to be very happy that this book explains the power and influence that you exercise over the government. Some of those are on the front cover, Jamie Dimon and... Right. Mr. And, and the fact that I call for their, their institutions to be broken up uh, in the afterword of the book would also make them not like it. And look, the officials who are named, and I don't, you know, I name the names, I lay out the conversations. Uh, so whether it's Secretary Geithner uh, or the people that I was working with. I don't want to ask you about who you're going to vote for or anything like that or politics, but d will it make a difference based on what you've seen if either the Republican or Democrats win in November? From what I've seen so far, unfortunately, no. I mean, I think both candidates at this point 
um, have only committed to continuing a status quo, essentially, that allows these large financial institutions to exist in their current form. Uh, neither candidate has supported breaking up the big banks, as of yet at least. Um, hope springs eternal. But, um, but right now, I think that you know, there are some differences in some policies around the edges between the two parties. But on the core issue of preserving uh, this very corrupting influence in Washington, uh, neither side seems to offer a solution. The title of the book is Bailout. The subtitle is An Inside Account of How Washington Abandoned Main Street While Rescuing Wall Street. Our guest has been Neil Borofsky, former Special Inspector General in charge of oversight of TARP. Thank you very much. Thank you. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.